folks and welcome to the Non-Diet Yogi Podcast. This is episode 23, Weight Neutral Women's Health, Holistic Preconception, Postpartum and Perimenopause with Dr. Caitlin O'Connor, ND. If you're a woman or you know one at pretty much any life stage, so whether you're thinking of having a baby and looking to support fertility or you're over 35 and seeing perimenopause on the horizon, there is something here for you. I'm your host, Casey Conroy, non-diet dietitian, naturopath in training and yoga teacher. So let me give you a heads up about Dr. Caitlin. I first came across Caitlin when I found an article that she had written for ASDA, that's the Association for Size, Diversity and Health, on health at every size and naturopathic medicine, which I will link to in the show notes. And it is an amazing article, might I add. Caitlin is so warm. She's bubbly, energetic and passionate and super humble, but also very, very smart. One of Caitlin's passions is perimenopause, which can begin from age 35 onwards. Now, I'm 36 and I will admit it, perimenopause isn't something I've previously given very much thought to, despite having some really close friends who are going through this life transition and despite working with perimenopausal and menopausal women um, and learning from the experiences that they share with me. If I'm very honest, I feel a little bit nervous when I think about what going through this transition, the change as Caitlin calls it, will be like for me. But whilst talking to Caitlin, I realise that I've undoubtedly bought into the patriarchal conditioning that surrounds us that tells women our worth is tied to our reproductive capacity, which is clearly rubbish. Many of us, myself included, fear losing some of the privileges that come along with youth and beauty. But Caitlin put a lot of those fears to rest for me and actually got me excited about this life phase. Caitlin is one of the few naturopathic doctors I know who is US based. So for folks um, who are listening from the US, hello. Over there, they do medical training in addition to naturopathic training and that's a lot of training. Caitlin's also one of the few naturopaths I know who is passionately weight neutral and haze aligned and when it comes to women's health especially preconception care, postpartum and perimenopause taking the emphasis off of weight and body shape and on to health is so important. And yet conflating aesthetics with health is something I see many people in the holistic and natural health world do, including practitioners. The naturopathic medicine community and the yoga community, might I add, are really exciting potential doorways to better health that are continually shaped by new discoveries and innovation and people coming onto the scene. The use of evidence-based herbal medicine, nutrition and lifestyle modifications all articulating along this backbone of nature as healer form a potent combination which, when applied with care and pointed wisdom, can really work wonders that allopathic or mainstream medicine simply can't. And this is especially so in the areas of hormonal balance and chronic disease management and even disease prevention, where modern medicine often, not always, but often fails to bring about lasting results coupled with quality of life. And yet, like any healing system in the 21st century where diet culture also exists, both the naturopathy and the yoga communities can be incredibly weight-centric. The training we get at uni makes me want to pull my hair out sometimes, especially when the O word, overweight, is added to the list of problems we are there to fix, in air quotes, for a client. It drives me crazy. Then there's the fact that meal replacement shakes, keto, collagen powders and weight loss supplements make up a significant sector of the practitioner-only ranges of some of the biggest supplement companies that service and educate both naturopaths and naturopathic students and nutrition students, might I add. And that sends a really clear message to current and future practitioners. 
the message that weight loss is a normal and very profitable part of naturopathic practice. But naturopathy was never intended to focus on weight loss. As more than one of my naturopathic lecturers have proclaimed, we ought to treat the person, not a disease, and certainly not a body shape and size. So this is a topic that's near and dear to me. The uncoupling of naturopathic medicine from the diet and weight loss industries really lies at the heart of this episode, which is why episode 24, my next bonus episode, will be all about laying that groundwork. Episode 24 will be a call to naturopaths and other holistic health practitioners to embrace a weight neutral approach. And that bonus will be available to Patreon subscribers. You can access it along with all my other bonus episodes, plus a growing library of goodies, including PDF guidebooks, audios, meditations, giveaways, and other guest offerings, all for just two US dollars a month, which is about three Australian dollars a month. Coming back to this episode, though, in this episode, we talk about what brought Dr. Caitlin to naturopathic medicine and to health at every size. The differences between naturopathic training in Australia versus the USA, weight centrality in naturopathic schools, the important questions that Caitlin asks when clients come to her seeking weight loss, how naturopathic advice can act as a pathway to eating disorders and body dysmorphia, and how we can take what's good and potentially helpful from naturopathic traditions but not have it cause harm. We talk about the fact that how your weight responds to treatment does not dictate if the treatment was successful. We talk about weight neutral preconception health and fertility, avoiding the shame spiral for those not getting pregnant despite trying to. We discuss how long the fourth trimester or postpartum really lasts and the idea that postpartum bodies are meant to look different to our pre-baby body. We discuss not conflating aesthetic goals with health goals and finally we talk all about the change or perimenopause. A quick bio, Dr. Caitlin provides naturopathic care for women and children. She pairs a philosophy of patient-centered, whole-body, individualized care with an emphasis on nutrition, botanical medicine, and a balanced approach to joyful living. For women, she has a focus on gut health, hormonal balance, optimal mood, and energy, with a specialty in enhancing preconception health and fertility while supporting a healthy pregnancy and postpartum. She also enjoys providing safe, effective options for children's health and wellness, especially optimizing gut health, immunity, and nutrition. So very last thing before we dive in, as I mentioned, if you love the podcast, please subscribe and leave a rating and review on Apple iTunes. To do so is dead easy. From the show page, just scroll down until you see the rating and review section with the five stars. And as I mentioned, for even more love and goodness, you can become a patron of the podcast um, and receive non-diet yogi bonuses in addition to so much other good juicy stuff. So here is my conversation with Caitlin. Hi, Caitlin, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you very, very much for being here. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So, Caitlin, could you please take a few minutes just to tell the listeners a bit about yourself? So, you know, what brought you to naturopathic medicine and particularly to the Hayes approach? Yeah, perfect. So, I'm a naturopathic doctor. I practice in Denver, Colorado, in the United States. Uh, I've been in practice for about 13 years now. I just realized that I had a friend shoot me a picture of uh, actually like a nutrition program that I ran in. 2010 and I was like wait what I was doing this in 2010 how is it possible (laughs) um so my practice focuses on women and children specifically I only see women and kids in my practice uh I also did midwifery training as part of my naturopathic training so in the United States I went to a school Bastyr University and at the time I went to that school you could do a additional program in naturopathic midwifery that doesn't wow. sort of exist as that specific program anymore they sort of separated it into two freestanding programs mm. um so that really 
even though I don't uh, deliver babies or attend births anymore, that really helped me narrow my focus into, you know, what phases of the life cycle are most interesting to me, where my, my passion is. And that really led me to sort of women in children's health and especially working with women sort of throughout the reproductive sort of lifespan um, from, you know, puberty through perimenopause. That's kind of where I really like to work. And I think the Hayes approach lends itself to that because I think it's impossible to work with anyone really, but specifically, you know, women and folks that were, you know, raised as women and not realize how detrimental sort of diet culture and our typical approach to weight loss is. So I think in sort of searching for my patients and searching for my husband, searching for myself, kind of coming to a philosophy that that sort of made sense to me. Uh, yes, I think I know exactly how you feel. Yeah. <laughs> because during your training, which I'll ask you about in a second, your naturopathic training, I'm guessing, assuming that Hayes wasn't really part of the curriculum. Like it no, wasn't. it was. No, yeah, no, not at all. Like, let's see. I graduated from naturopathic school. I think in 2007, 2008, if I'm doing my math right, and then sort of did a year of residency, but that really wasn't on my radar at that time and certainly wasn't what we were taught or you know what was mirrored to us. I, I don't think I heard of Hayes specifically probably until I'd been in practice for, for a few years at least and then um, sort of started to dig into sort of that more weight neutral mm. approach. And I think, you know, I was aware of, you know, diet culture and, and some of the sort of negative things that come along with that earlier, yeah. um, but certainly didn't have a, have a name for or approach to it. And I think didn't have that framework of sort of questioning what I had been taught about what is health, and you know how do how do we define that? I think definitely I was still during my training um, not approaching health through a weight neutral mm -hmm. lens at mm -hmm. all. Uh, so that definitely was a, a process to kind of challenge challenge myself and, and challenge some of the things I've been taught. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I am currently going. I'm finishing my naturopathic training now. I'm in the home run stretch of it, and Ooh, yeah, yeah, it's. It's so weight central and I've been practicing as a dietitian for 10 years. Um, most of that as a weight neutral dietitian and oh my God, it's, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Have you found like, um, have you had the opportunity to sort of like push back and offer different perspectives? Have <laughs> yeah. those been, yeah. you know, yeah, welcomed or? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I don't always manage to keep my mouth shut. I try to do it in, you know, a relatively kind gentle way but oh man sometimes it, I'm just gritting my teeth <laughs> well there's so much you know I'm sure I'm sure we'll get into this in more detail yeah. but I think there's this really uh unhealthy overlap in the naturopathic holistic sort of mm -hmm. world um with this real attachment to like weight and weight loss and and that sort of being a primary measure of health and something that you should encourage and promote and you know to use so much even in like the marketing of like a quote-unquote like natural or holistic lifestyle um it's hard to separate the two and there's there's some there's some deep deep roots and some serious dogma there so I haven't necessarily found across the board that the that the sort of naturopathic world is fully on board with a haze approach yeah we still have a lot of a lot of work to do and education to do I think yeah I agree I agree actually just to set the scene I'm in Australia obviously yeah. where we study a four-year undergrad health science degree and we come out as a naturopath but you folks in the U.S. it's a bit different there right you undergo some basic medical training first can you just briefly explain yeah. so what isn't it, yeah so um in the States, we do a, you do a four-year undergrad that's like a pre-med, um, pre-med undergrad, and then you do an additional four years of specific naturopathic medical school. Oh my God, um, that's eight years. Wow. Yeah, it's eight years plus or minus a residency. So I did a one-year residency in family medicine, and then my, my uh, 
naturopathic medical school is actually five years because I did the additional midwifery training oh. during that time. Uh, we had to attend between 100 and 150 births to, get, wow. to be able to get credentialed and licensed. Um, so the naturopathic, and they've actually changed the training where I believe you start your clinical training your first year, and it's sort of interwoven into the four years. But when I went, you did your first two years that were mostly like the basic sciences um, and some like clinical application. But then the last two years were, mo were sort of a mix of in-class work, work with preceptors and the, working in the student clinic. Um, and then based on where you practice, so this is interesting in the United States, we've got you know, 50 states and some territories and the regulation of naturopathic medicine is really different from state to state. So for example, where I went to school in Washington state, we were regulated by that state pretty much like primary care providers. Um, so in network with insurance companies, able to order labs and prescribe medications like pretty broadly where I practice in the state of Colorado we are regulated with the state to be able to practice medicine so we are considered you know doctors who can practice medicine we can order lab work we can um, order imaging and things like that however we have a pretty narrow prescriptive authority and there's not any regulation around insurance so we tend to be, for the most part, in some of the more rural areas, there are some doctors that work with local insurances just because there's not a lot of options for healthcare in general. But I'm in Denver, which is sort of our, our more metropolitan area. Uh, so we tend to be cash practice, but we do sort of have a relatively broad scope as far as the practice of medicine, although limited to what we can do with pharmaceuticals in the state. So it's interesting. There's some states where naturopathic medicine is completely unregulated. Um, there's some states where you're primary care and there's some states where you're in between. Wow. Gosh, you guys cover such a wide range of modalities and you're, you're definitely exposed to both worlds, right? That the complementary or integrative and the mainstream or allopathic approach. And that's why I, I really value what you were saying in this fantastic article that you wrote for ASDA, which is how I found you, you yeah. stated you, you really, um, made this clear that you know, and I'm going to quote you here I hope that that's okay Oops, um, right. you said I think we sometimes are exposed to the worst of both worlds the fat phobic teachings of conventional medicine and the fat shaming world of holistic health and to me that just says so much so being in both worlds Caitlin what kind of you know harmful weight centric practices have you witnessed do they differ on each of those two sides and what can we do about it? <laughs> yeah. <a> question. <laughs> yeah, great questions. Yeah, I think what's what's interesting about our particular intersection and probably as a dietitian, something that you bump your head against all mm -hmm. the time is we're operating in a, you know, a modality where a big tenet of our approach to health does revolve around food and nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a conversation that we're having with people a lot but there's, it's so, it's such a weighted conversation and such like a, um, such a conversation that's like tainted by, you know, the fat phobia and the diet culture that people have been raised with and their experience with. It's, it's so, it's been tricky for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I still don't have it completely figured out. It's like, how do we navigate that area of saying like, well, yeah, we might want to experiment with sort of different ways to eat or different times to eat and different types of food, but also, do it in a way that's free from shame and free from judgment and kind of getting to that place of like neutral observer, mm -hmm. as well as like what parameters are we testing and how do we take weight? Like, for example, to me, I, I don't care. I'm like, we're going to do this intervention, but the numbers on the scale are not a measure of our success. Yes or no. Right. We don't, I'm not interested in what happens there. I'm interested in what happens with your energy, your ability to move your body in a way that you want to move your body. What's your sleep like? What's your mood like? Um, but oftentimes people are coming with such preset ideas, you know, they'll come in and say, oh, I was bad. I, a brownie. Don't, or, you know, oh, I'll ask, okay, well, tell me a breakfast, lunch, dinner. Well, I've been really bad lately. I'm like, well, you're not, a, this is not a value judgment. It's not bad or good. It's just like a neutral report of what we've been doing. And how did that, how did that make you feel? Yes or no. Um, 
So it's tough because, you know, there's patients who come to me specifically for weight loss. And then I'm kind of like, Ooh, all right. Yeah. What you, do you do there? <laughs> you're not reading my website. <laughs> I'm like, uh, um, and then, you know, there's people saying, Oh, well, my, you know, I've got X problem and Y problem and Z problem, but my primary care doctor told me, you know, basically I just need to lose weight. So that's why I'm, you know, here to see you. Um, and it, what do I what I do is probably disappoint and annoy a lot of people. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I probably frustrate folks. I'm sure there's you know I, I try to be pretty upfront with my philosophy around sort of weight and size. You know, with my paperwork and my website. Um, but I still get people, and we kind of have to go through our our sh- my little you know <laughs> spiel of well you know this is, you know, my approach and this is the Hayes approach and here's some materials and you should read this book and uh, let's, you know, I'm happy to work with you on improving your health overall, but you should know that, you know, that weight in and of itself is not the only way that we measure health and you can be unhealthy at a small size and you can be healthy at a larger size. And actually a lot of, you know, a lot of people I see, for what are who are interested in weight loss it is not a there's no there's no health issue it's purely like mm-hmm. oh I have this ideal of what I think my body should look like yeah. and I'm willing to sacrifice my health to look like that that's mm-hmm. another conversation we have that like oh it might not be mentally or physically healthy to do these things that you think you should do to manage your size um so yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. I would say navigating those conversations is one of the hardest things I've had to do as a provider. Um, and I, I don't have a, I don't have a perfect yet. I haven't, I haven't mm-hmm. cracked the code. I <laughs> a lot of conversation, a lot of referring back to the, you know, the data and saying, well, actually, you know, like, <laughs> It's a hard one. It's so deeply embedded into our culture yes. that to be thin and in a small body means that you're healthy, that when you start to challenge that, I mean, mm-hmm. people get upset, they get angry, they uh, don't come back for another appointment. Oh, yeah. right? yeah. uh, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, I've, I've made some converts along the way and I'm hopeful sure. that I've... Uh, spared people from some of that you know additional trauma that comes along with kind of working with providers that are are pushing that fat phobic agenda yeah. um but i i certainly haven't cracked code it's something that I, mm-hmm. I bring myself back to even with simple recommendations like oh you know I think eliminating this particular food group might be helpful for this person, but what are the pros and cons of a, um, like an elimination diet potentially? And can that trigger disordered eating patterns, especially in kids? You know, it's, it's such a weighty topic that I'm, that I'm constantly wrestling with. Like what is the broader, you know, pros and cons of some of our dietary interventions. And, uh, like I said, it would, uh, I wish I had the perfect answer. It's, it's something that I continue, I continue to, to wrestle with and consider on a pretty much daily basis. Yes. Oh my gosh. Same here. And I've found that it's been, I don't know if this happens where you are, Caitlin, but in my experience here, there, there are a pretty significant number of people who tell me that they, in the past, that they've sought out naturopaths, naturopathic doctors, holistic practitioners, kind of knowing that they would be affirmed in their beliefs, you know, beliefs and and practices around um, restricting certain foods or cutting out whole food groups indiscriminately or going on a strict cleanse and so on. And beliefs that are really endorsed by diet culture and often cause harm, but can be kind of disguised as wellness um oh yeah it's like the eating disorder to vegan pathway right yeah. like the pipeline yeah. of oh all right well I'm not on a diet anymore but I'm yeah. doing lifestyle I'm doing 
keto or paleo, you know, and, and again, there are aspects of all of those programs that might be beneficial for health. health. Totally. And also there's aspects, especially to sort of the strictness and the language around it and that judgment piece that could be detrimental to people's health, especially if it's just a substitute for, you know, dietary control, right? I'm not restricting calories anymore. I'm just, you know, doing a cleanse. I'm not, you know, I'm not, not, I'm not, not eating. I'm just doing a juice fast for two weeks. And you're like, oh man, how do we know? But what's interesting, I mean, there is like, you know, traditions within sort of naturopathic medicine, like mm-hmm. nature cure of water fasting and water yeah. and thing. And it's like, mm. how do we yeah. take what's, what's good and potentially helpful, but not have it cause net harm. Um, yes. It's a, it's definitely a, a narrow, a narrow line to navigate. Oh my gosh. It really, it really is. And that do no harm. Um, part of it is obviously so important to basic mm-hmm. principles. Um, and I'm just wondering, as we talk about this, like, how can we, how can we as naturopaths or, you know, holistic health practitioners, how can we develop a better awareness of eating disorders in general and, and recognize the signs of disordered eating in our client like to truly do no harm it is a tricky balance isn't it as you say yeah well and if you go I mean if I just go back to my education I remember one of our class projects was you had to do an elimination diet Mm -hmm. as part of like a class project and there were a number of people that that triggered a relapse into disordered eating behaviors for them um, and there was no discussion. I do not remember. And I should say, I do not recall. I don't know if this discussion happened and I don't remember it, but I certainly don't recall that ever being a topic of discussion. I remember, you know, broadly people saying like, oh, okay, well, if somebody is, you know, a history of anorexia, maybe don't do an elimination diet or like a food diary. Um, but not really any in-depth discussion of that and not in discussion of what about you know, the broad swaths of people that maybe don't qualify or, you know, meet the criteria for a specific clinical eating disorder, but have like pretty disordered eating patterns and body dysmorphia and, you know, all of, all of these other things that can be sort of triggered by that type of restriction. Um, And that's a topic like, you know, so I think it begins with the education. I think it also begins with um, clinicians sort of addressing their own bias, addressing their own thoughts around um, elimination and restricted eating. And then really, I mean, it's a discussion I always have with my patients talking about disordered eating, um, histories of eating disorders, things like that is, is just a conversation I have almost always at the first appointment with people because I am trying to get a little bit of a vibe for like, all right, where are we in our journey with you know, food, because I don't think that there's a sort of human being that's raised in the, you know, Western nutrition paradigm that like gets out unscathed, right? Mm, <laughs> like, probably not. <laughs> everybody, everybody is carrying some sort of weird damage <laughs> with them, uh, yep. you know, just based off of what they've been exposed to sort of growing up with, you know, a particular diet culture. And of course I'm referencing like a, you know, American experience. I can't sort of push that out into what's happening in the rest of the world, but I feel like it's, you know, with globalization, we've like globalized some like <laughs> exploded a few. <laughs> yeah, we've exploded some like uh, bad, bad beliefs and then distributed them across the world. But certainly, you know, from, from my perspective, Uh, And in my patient population, regardless, and that's the other thing that's wild is the way that fat phobia harms people of all sizes, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, is that even folks who sort of fall into like standard size and clothing or even would meet, you know, specific uh, like conventional beauty ideals are still pretty miserable about their bodies. <laughs> it's like, 
You can't win. Nobody's winning. <laughs> Everybody's miserable. Uh, and it doesn't matter because it is this, you know, uh, this myth that's just like, you know, in my opinion, perpetuated to keep people uh, out of their power to some degree. Um, so everybody, everybody is affected by it. Uh, so I think it just starts with kind of getting back to that like critical viewpoint. Okay, why am I doing this? What's the potential benefit? What's the potential risk? Reviewing with the patient and then being very clear about what you expect outcomes to be. Like I'm always very clear that, you know, how your weight responds to a treatment does not dictate if the treatment was successful. Cause you'll also have people come back and they're like, oh, my, my migraines are gone. I'm pooping every day, but your treatment protocol didn't work because I didn't lose any weight. <laughs> oh, no. And I'm like, uh -huh. no, you don't understand. <laughs> your body is at a healthy set point. Like yeah. it's fine. That's not the goal, but I've definitely had folks. I used to actually run with a colleague of mine, um, nutritional reset program. So we did seasonal nutrition and lifestyle programs. She was an acupuncturist and I'm a naturopathic mm. doctor. So we sort of blended TCM and naturopathic medicine. Um, and very specifically, it was very important to me. We ran these programs for about six years Then my partner had twins and we kind of put things on hiatus when she went on maternity leave. And, um, but we ran them for about five or six years and I was always very intentional about not marketing weight loss, mm. not talking about weight loss and advertising it as like a weight neutral nutrition program. Even though we actually met with a marketing person to help us like write their, write our copy. Yeah. And they were like, well, you have to, you know, <laughs> you have to tell people they're and I was like, no, we're not mentioning it. It's not, <laughs> not a topic weird. I'm trying to be, and again, it's a tricky thing. Cause you know, we are talking about food and we would be on these, we would have like a closed Facebook group and inevitably people would say, well, I'm doing this to, to lose weight. We'd have to jump on and be like, well, actually this is a weight neutral. <laughs> like, <laughs> weight is not a measure of health. And you know, the outcome is not, blah, blah. but I mean, even in intentionally being uh, trying to push back against that by, by being weight neutral in our advertising and uh, messaging and things like that, it still would, it still would infiltrate. Mm -hmm. um, and people would still say, well, I ate, you know, I did this for, they'd love to call it a diet. I did your diet. And I'm like, oh no, please <laughs> no. Don't, don't say the word. And then I did your diet for three weeks and I did not lose a single pound. And I'm like, okay. And why? <laughs> but um, it's it's so deeply it's mm. so deeply embedded in in everything that we do. Um, I just think it's this very slow process of you know, you know, extracting our own minds as clinicians and addressing our own bias of addressing you know bias when we see it in our colleagues when we see it in you know continuing education when our page and then and then chatting talk, talking with our patients even letting them know that this that this is a thing that health at every size exists mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. yeah. i think for some people it's really liberating but to some people it's really scary, scary. And <laughs> they don't, you know if you've wrapped wrapped your whole identity in life around like okay well this is this is what healthy looks like um challenging that belief just opens up a mega can of worms Oh my gosh, it really, really does. And that kind of discussion is bringing me to something else I wanted to ask you about, which is preconception health and fertility and yeah. how the weight centric kind of way of looking oh, at things yeah. can creep into that. Um, Cause I know those areas, you know, preconception, supporting pregnancy, postpartum are passions of yours. You know, you've yes. done that training in naturopathic midwifery, which just sounds so epic to me. Um, yeah. And there is what I've seen at least is that there is so much emphasis on women getting into perfect shape before pregnancy. Um, you know, women in larger bodies, at least people have come to talk to me are, often told that they need to lose X percentage of their body weight, even though- Yeah, I mean, that's a standard, that's a standard in the reproductive endocrinology yeah. world. Yeah. Um, there's also, you know, um, 
at least here there is weight restriction and BMI restriction around where mm. you can birth. I know yes, there's some here too. birth centers that mm. can't or won't take folks that have a higher BMI. Mm. Um, there's reproductive endocrinologists that won't work with people yeah. until they lose weight. And on the, the the first thing that I think is really tricky is you're basically saying, do this thing, but this thing actually might be impossible. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's like the, to, when when people when patients get the advice of okay, just go lose weight, as if <sighs> like oh, all right, let me just go do that because for the most part, folks that have higher BMIs and have larger bodies have been engaging in diet culture for a majority of their life because people have been telling them that's what they need to do Mm -hmm. and healthcare, you know, it's like um, Mm -hmm. this idea that the they're the experts in dieting. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Like uh, oftentimes people with higher BMIs have done every single diet because they've just been so mm-hmm. chastised and shamed. And then the idea that like, oh yeah, you're right. You're right. Oh, I should just lose weight. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know you were going to mm. tell me. That. Let me just go try harder. <laughs> what a and revelation. Like, yeah. What a revelation. <laughs> Thank you. What should I uh, eat less calories and exercise more? Mm. Okay, perfect. Let me, yes. let me Sounds awesome. sounds super straightforward and easy, oh, right? And it's gosh. like, well, first of all, yeah. you're giving advice that doesn't have an answer, right? Yeah. You're telling somebody to do things that for the majority of people, as we know from the data, dieting is not successful for long-term weight loss. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the first frustrating part. Uh, the second frustrating, and, but and this is another thing where that there is, and I don't have a reference to a specific study, but there is a study for that was done on women with PCOS and fertility. And it did find in this particular study that losing, I think, 5% of their body weight resulted in like better fertility rates, um, which is then tricky, right? Because you have reproductive endocrinologists pointing to the specific piece of data, which is, uh, you know, there's not a lot of data around sort of women's reproductive health in the first place, but a lot, that's where it comes from is there's this specific study that um, I can't remember when it was published, but you know, it's not super great. It's not super robust, but it is data that reproductive endocrinologists and uh, OB-GYNs in general will say, oh, okay, well, there's this one study. So I guess just go out and lose weight. And until you do that, we're not going to investigate any other causes of potential issues for fertility for you. Um, So it's that tricky intersection of like, okay, there's this, you know, could weight loss be helpful for fertility in some cases, perhaps, but how do we get there safely? And is it even possible? And then, you know, we're only looking at short-term outcomes as far as like returning to ovulation and pregnancy, but not long-term outcomes on metabolism. It's just another one that's very hard to navigate. So in my practice, obviously that's not sort of my personal focus, but I certainly work with a lot of people who say, oh, my, before I can do IVF, my reproductive endocrinologist wants me to work with like a dietitian or nutritionist and lose X amount of pounds before they're willing to work with me. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's definitely another challenging one to potentially approach. Um, what I do in my practice, you know, personally, I always think of healthy preconception and healthy fertility as being the downstream effect of a well-regulated system. Now, that's not to say that fertility is an outcome that's available to everybody, uh, which is another tricky thing. I mean, I always say when it comes to fertility, there is still a lot of sort of mystery there as far as who gets pregnant sometimes and who doesn't. Um, And we have to be really careful in again because that's a, it's another area where people can get into this like shame spiral of like well I'm not getting pregnant I might be I must be doing something wrong 
and there's a there's a you know there's epigenetics at play there's genetics at play and it, it's definitely a big um an area where you have to be really really intentional about saying you can be doing everything quote unquote right you can be in good health and still not get fertility as an outcome um which is a bummer. That's what makes fertility care like one of the hardest things to do because uh, you you don't necessarily get that that guaranteed baby, and that's true with you know IVF and IUI and and all of the assisted re reproductive technologies as well. Um, but the way that I approach fertility and preconception overall is working on all the basic things that are supportive for health, looking at things like sleep stress management, movement, eating a diverse variety of foods that, you know, meet your body's needs, um, and then doing a thorough, you know, workup, not just saying, oh, well, all you have to do is lose weight. Mm -hmm. Until then, I'm not going to look at hormone levels or look at your nutrition or address any other part of your, your whole body. Yeah, that truly holistic whole person approach, which is one of the reasons I think people go to see naturopathic practitioners it's yeah, just, it's, yeah yeah it's being seen as like a human not just like yeah. you know a uterus and a <laughs> just kind of toddling around you know I always say when I'm working with fertility I'm looking at the whole body not just like yeah. the pelvis yes oh that is music to my ears so okay so that's fertility and preconception if we fast forward a little bit um to postpartum we're often told and I know this this is something that you talk about but we're told that the three months after the birth of your baby uh that's the fourth trimester and after that you know we should basically be able to go back to normal but I know you have a slightly different opinion oh my god Caitlin. yeah this is uh, this is like uh, uh one of those topics that I'm like put it, put it on my, put it on my tombstone postpartum <laughs> two year process at a minimum. Yes. Minimum two year process. I, I think of the first three months that sort of as being what I would call like acute postpartum. Uh -huh. <laughs> Early postpartum, acute postpartum, sort of one, you know, one of the more intense sort of periods of postpartum although I have a lot of people that kind of sail through the first three months mm. kind of high on oxytocin and adrenaline yes <laughs> uh, and then kind of crash between month four and six when all of a sudden you've got like the cumulative sleep debt or unfortunately I don't know what what kind of parental leave do you guys have in Australia because we're in there oh. we're really embarrassing it's, it's better than what you guys have that's for sure yeah. what you we've, what you got what, it sounds terrible in the US. We've, got like nothing. we've got anywhere from nothing uh, to at the most people think 12 uh three to four months is like a generous parental oh god policy oh uh, so oftentimes it's really common for and that's for that's for the the person who gave birth the the partner often gets zero to two weeks i've had some folks you know some companies are starting to do like equitable parental leave where both parents can get longer you know time periods but i would say what's most common is the person who gives birth maybe gets 12 weeks and that's like assuming they have more of like a corporate job with benefits versus you know working for themselves or working part-time or kind of doing gigs um, and their partner gets zero to two weeks. So oftentimes at sort of three to four months is when somebody's going back to work. And that's actually a really common time, I think, for people to start to develop postpartum depression and anxiety. And I think it is because it's an unsustainable uh, practice. Like, I'm like, yeah, it's not you. Like people will come to me, they're like, I don't know what's wrong. I'm so tired. I feel overwhelmed. Why can't I keep it together? I'm going back to work. And I'm like, because this is a dumb idea. <laughs> like, because the idea of somebody that is the primary caregiver for a four-month-old infant to also be expected to work 40 hours a week and be able to wake up at a specific oh, time and like not take naps. I'm like, Goodness. that is an unsustainable idea and you're not doing it wrong. Like that's, that's my big, that's my big message with postpartum overall. I'm like, you're not doing it wrong it's just hard and it's made more hard because we have all of these strange 
cultural ideas of, oh, by 12 weeks, you should be, you know, uh, fully back to quote unquote normal and you should be bouncing back and you can go back, you can have sex and you can run a marathon and you can, you know, go back to work and do all these things. And if somebody wants to do all those things and their body is ready to it, like that is reasonable as well. It's not saying there's a right or a wrong way to do postpartum. However, most people at that stage are still pretty early in the phases of recovery, are still dealing with a child that is physiologically normal for them to be up every two to three hours throughout the night needing to be fed. Yes. Um, and so much of the angst I think that comes around postpartum is our wanting things to be different so that we can get back to normal sooner because there's no structural support for it to not be back to normal, right? We're expected to be up at work. We're expected to be, you know, wearing whatever clothes fit us before. We're expected to just, you know, be posting our, you know, monthly Instagram update picture <laughs> with our baby and the little, you know, little outfits. And if we're not meeting those standards, it's like, I must be doing something wrong. And then again, getting into that cycle of like self-judgment and, and things like that, which is, isn't helpful for anybody. And then you layer on top of that, this idea that our bodies should somehow miraculously be back and looking mm. and feeling exactly the way they did before we like Amen. created an entire human from nothing inside of our <laughs> own body. And then, you know, got them out. <laughs> like a pretty big deal yeah that's probably going to physically change you for quite some time if not forever mm -hmm. um so that that's my big spiel around postpartum <laughs> I usually think for folks that have uh one baby so like a singleton pregnancy I usually say postpartum is a two-year process and by two years or so most folks should be settling into to a new normal although depending on length of breastfeeding and um what your kiddo's temperament, right? Like that can be adjusted. Like some folks who are, you know, breastfeeding toddlers and their toddlers are still up a bunch at night, uh, which can certainly be a variation of normal. Um, that is, that might extend their postpartum a little bit. Twins, I think it can take three to four years oh, to yeah. recover wow. fully from a twin pregnancy. Um, I see sort of folks that have had twins and I'm like yeah it's kind of closer to three if not four years it's like two two years per child that you just oh my God. <laughs> uh but I don't think there's a lot of you know respect for mm -hmm. that that process and then certainly I see folks you know who I'm talking to them about their postpartum anxiety and they're mm -hmm. not eating and they're back to doing you know pretty intense exercise regimes because they're trying to uh, speed up postpartum weight loss and are concerned about that sort of bounce back, snap back kind mm -hmm. of uh, idea. And I'm like, this is not, you know, there is no time where you really, <laughs> there's no great time to restrict food, but mm -hmm. postpartum is certainly not, not a, not a time where that's a, that's, going to be helpful for mood for energy for your ability to parent but there there's such pressure on folks that oh my body needs to go back to how it looked before and mm. I think even for people who didn't necessarily have a lot of sort of struggles around diet and body image it can be a, a big triggering point for them so yes that's one of my favorite things to to counsel folks about postpartum is just to sort of be gentle about the process and to sort of let go of some of those weight or, or body shaped goals or anything like that yes oh it's so heartbreaking when when I see women who are you know sometimes as early as two three months postpartum that they are back into boot camps and back into you know really strict dieting and they are just falling apart trying to meet these ridiculous expectations um yeah it's yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a bummer <laughs> like, it really I, and the thing that makes me sad is that I understand the why right mm -hmm. it's like they're still, people aren't coming up with these ideas yeah. out of their own head and no. I don't 
you know, blame or judge that person. I'm like, yeah, there is so much intense societal pressure. Uh, I understand why you would think this is the thing you should be doing, Mm -hmm. but also let's examine some different, you know, lenses and paradigms that that we could, you know, what, what's another way to look at it? Like, here's one way. Yeah. What else is out there, right? Let's yeah. expand our horizon a little bit because it is, and I think especially um, in social media, and definitely, let's say you've got a, a social media feed that's a lot of, you know, mm. holistic nutrition influencer type folks. Mm-hmm. Like yep. you're going to be fed those images. You are going to be, you know, being exposed to diet culture through a different lens. Um, and it's going to impact what you think you should look like and what you think you should be eating and what's considered, you know, good versus good versus bad. Um, so it's, it's definitely an understandable, uh, situation that folks find themselves in, but I really, you know, Mm. love to offer some, some different perspectives to kind of throw in the mix there, because I think a lot of the times people are just looking for sort of permission or, a, you know, like, like, or, or just, again, that idea, you know, ideally it would be, you know, we would just, everyone would, would be able to come to that from like self, uh, self realization, but there is something about hearing somebody who's the quote unquote expert mm-hmm. or in a position of authority being like, it's fine, chill out. Don't weigh yourself. Don't even think about, you know, looking at the clothes that you wore before pregnancy for at least two years and if at that point you know you still are interested in in changing the shape of your body you know I I I do you know that's the other thing that's interesting is I feel like everybody has the there's like a you can pursue aesthetic goals if you want to Hmm. like it's your right everybody's body just like if you want to have plastic surgery if you want to change things about your body like mm-hmm. that is fine that is your right person but I I don't think I will conflate that with like health stuff like understand why we're doing it you were yes. doing that because you want your body to look a certain way and what's the why behind that uh and also it's not not for health necessarily yeah, but that's right mm-hmm. it's still something you can do right like totally. can, oh yeah I respect your goals body. Yeah. I respect <laughs> your goals but let's let's make them realistic and let's frame them appropriately yeah and also yeah. understand what we will and will not get from pursuing those goals that's um, right yeah and if they're coming to see you you are a health practitioner you're yes. going to be focused on the health aspect of it. And if you can see that someone's goal is not health centered, you're going to, you're going to yeah, say something point about it that. Out. <laughs> like, oh, that's not health centered. And in fact, what you are doing is actually decreasing your health, right? Like yeah. both mentally and physically, this is actually not a pursuit of health. This is, yeah. this is the opposite. This is harming you. And, and can we look at the ways that it's harmful and then, you know, try to do it in a less harmful way, or you know, maybe you go see somebody else <laughs> yeah, more willing to let people harm themselves in the yeah. pursuit of like, well, I guess. I mean, not to, not to kind no. of a harsh way to say it, but I think to some degree it's true. And and there's a lot of denial, I think, in the holistic world about the harms that mm-hmm. that this can do. And and it's it's you know, I am a diehard naturopathic doctor. Like I really believe in our medicine. And at the same time, I don't have, you know, rose colored glasses about this is also a system that can be harmful, just like Mm. conventional medicine, you know, every, every system has some harms to it, but I also don't think we can rely on tradition and not like evolve, like, as you know, better starting to, to do better and not, um say well this you know we've always done this or you know we've always done it that way it's like okay yes and like let's analyze and move forward uh we don't get a we don't get a free pass just because it's quote unquote the natural way or holistic way um of doing things like we have very very harsh critiques of you know western or conventional medicine and I'm like well also let's Mm -hmm. you know 
turn that turn that reflection back on ourselves and like see where where can we potentially evolve and and push our profession forward in a way yeah. that's less harmful overall yeah that critical analysis which is you know actually being considered as a seventh um principle of naturopathic medicine now is so oh. important it's so important um Oh gosh, there's so much there. I, I just want to dive in. But we would be talking for about five hours if we did that. So you know, I know it's so to... it's like it's such a juicy topic, and then the tangents can't can't stop themselves <laughs> <laughs> tangenting. Oh my gosh! But I know that I know that our time is limited. I want to respect your time, so I do want to ask one more thing, Caitlin. I think possibly yeah. two more things, but definitely this sure. one. Um, you, I understand, have or are about to release a podcast all about the perimenopause, actually. And being, I'm turning 37 this year, this is something I'm definitely beginning to think about. And yes, even with all the wonderful humans that I've worked with of all ages and, and with what I know about going into this phase of life, I still have this element of trepidation and I guess fear of the unknown. So can you tell us a bit about the signs that someone may be entering the change as you describe it and yeah. how we can create space for this and celebrate it instead of fear. Oh yeah. And so, yeah, I'm uh, about to birth a podcast called The Change. It was a, as a bigger, a bigger project than I anticipated. <laughs> it's taken a little bit longer, but they're about that to happens. be born. <laughs> yeah. um, I was joking with a friend. I was like, I feel like I've been at 10 centimeters for a while now. I just <laughs> project out get it into the world um so it's starting as a 10 episode series it's called the change and our tagline it's a podcast for perimenopause a podcast about perimenopause for people in their 30s and 40s um i think one of the biggest misconceptions that i see in my practice is folks you know 35 and up not understanding oh we're starting to put put our our feet onto that perimenopausal bridge that takes us from regular ovulatory cycles to no longer ovulating um and what are some of those like things that can shift and change and you know there's a lot of symptoms i think sort of the bigger ones that happen in what i would call early perimenopause uh, which for most folks kind of starts around 40, but it can be as early as 35 and as late as 45. Um, definitely menstrual irregularities, shorter periods, heavier periods, um, mood shifts that come along with that. Insomnia is a big one or just changes in sleep. The, you know, waking up at that two to 3 a.m. mark is a big one. And then um, there's a lot of shifts in musculoskeletal symptoms that I don't think people realize, um, some increases in, in pain, especially for people with chronic pain, uh, and headaches. Headaches are a big one as well. And I just think when we understand, oh, there might be a hormonal component to these changes, well, then it opens up, you know, especially in our world, it opens up this like rich toolbox of potential approaches. Um, and then I also think there's sometimes some changes that just need to be normalized. Like people will come to me in their early forties and be like, oh my God, something's terribly wrong. My menstrual cycle is irregular. I've always been every 28 days, but for the last year, I've had some cycles that were 22 days and some cycles that were 42 days. And like, we have to test my hormones. What's wrong? Mm -hmm. And then we kind of go through all these things and like, you really don't have any, you know, this isn't pathological. You don't have any other symptoms. Let's just explain what's happening here. And with that explanation, that's everything normal. It's that, you know, docere, doctor's teacher principle. Um, mm -hmm. I think the more education people have, the less mysterious it is. And I think so much of the reason we have a sort of fear around perimenopause and then the transition to sort of postmenopause is wrapped up into so much of what we've been talking about, um, sort of fat phobia, which is like, a cousin to, you know, ableism and uh, racism and patriarchy, all of these things that say, oh, basically, when you have moved past your time of reproductive viability and like, quote unquote, like desirability, you know, which is going to be framed differently for every person, some people maybe 
that hasn't been a big part of their life or other folks that has been a big way that either they have been identified or self-identify losing some of the privilege that comes along with like youth and beauty is like a big real thing um and that can certainly be scary for folks. So I really, you know, not only in the podcast are we talking about, okay, what's happening physiologically, but kind of talking about what's happening culturally, yes. where does that fear come from and how can we sort of reimagine, mm. reimagine it? Because when you actually do look at like the research, you know, folks in their like 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s are like, way happier (laughs) they're still having sex they're still happy they're still like viable human beings it's just all this like the lens we see of like oh you know I mean I know when I was you know in my 20s I thought people you know I'm 43 like oh 43 year olds like well that's pretty much over your life is over how boring (laughs) like and I'm like oh actually being in your 40s is awesome I can only (laughs) anticipate you know so far I have found each subsequent decade like more liberating than the last I'm like great let's let's keep on this trajectory but uh (laughs) I I love the conversations that I've been able to have with people it's a mix of interviewing different folks um acupuncturists gynecologists other naturopathic doctors and then I have a couple segments that's just me and my two best friends just like chatting about stuff like this like all right well what's your experience been like and how do we intentionally you know make changes that we want to see so the the title of the podcast being the change is not only sort of in reference to perimenopause being called the change but also like how can we change our perceptions and how can we create an experience that's like more rich and robust and doesn't sort of feel like we're just you know (laughs) slowly walking into like a dried out dusty like husk of a future I'm like that's that doesn't sound very fun so yeah that's that's what I've been doing there and certainly oh my god a bit you know most women will gain somewhere between five to 15 pounds, if not more during the perimenopausal transition. And there's a big change in like body shape that goes along with changing hormones, which is a huge can of worms for people and such a huge issue. So we definitely like address, you know, where that comes from and, and why, and you know, how, again, it's not, it's not a health indicator. Um, It's just a, reality of living in a human body that changes over time which is like better than the alternative (laughs) yes not having a human body (laughs) exactly (laughs) and your body doing such an intelligent innate amazing thing you know you know when you were talking about those body compositional changes that can take place women can you know deposit more abdominal fat and that is actually a good thing as, as and the like, ovaries yeah. start to wind down that's protective yeah and there's actually I mean this is where some uh data even though you know BMI is a is kind of dumb you know, <laughs> you know, agree. we don't like BMI as a measurement it doesn't make sense no, we don't it's used a lot in the research so sometimes we have to reference that yeah, we'll to but uh it. folks with a larger BMI do much better both uh like as far as like a lot of the health outcomes around like osteoporosis and frailty mm. postmenopausally so yeah it's a, you know we can we can look at all the phases of life, but definitely sort of perimenopause into menopause is a, a really interesting topic to me right now. Oh my gosh. I cannot wait for your podcast to come out. <laughs> I'm about it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for creating that. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to it being birthed. Yeah. So <laughs> Caitlin, I know that, you know, it's time for us to wrap up and I so appreciate you sharing your wisdom in such a fun and encouraging way so yeah I really appreciate your balanced approach you have this really balanced approach to natural therapies as well as this emphasis on um, evidence-based intervention and this real philosophy that we don't have to choose between naturopathic or conventional approach we can we can use both our hands not have one tied behind our back use use the best of both worlds and sort of apply that same critical lens to the stuff that's like not serving us, not serving our patients. And 
it's just been so fun when you sent me like the list of our topics. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. I didn't even About get through half of what I was I know. I was <laughs> like, that's ambitious because I, I yeah. have a lot. I have a, obviously have a lot. To say. <laughs> Which is oh, so thanks. wonderful. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a topic that I just think is, you know, so important. So I was so excited to see that, you know, there's not not a ton of us in this world that are, you know, actively pursuing a health at every size philosophy and, you know, actively, you know, caring for our patients in that way. So it was just so great to make a connection with, with another uh, kindred spirit in that area. So I was very excited to get a chance to talk to you and, you know, keep, help you continue to spread this word. And I think, you know, let I think a lot of patients feel ostracized by the holistic approach or feel like oh I don't fit in to a quote-unquote you know healthy lifestyle um because you know I'm going to be you know judged I can't go to the gym or I'm not you know going to be you know welcome in this person's office because my body looks a certain way I think there's a big barrier to the folks who want who could benefit I mean everybody in my opinion everybody benefits from naturopathic medicine but there's probably folks who don't come to the profession because they're scared of what they're going to find or they've been Mm -hmm. shamed or they think it's going to only be focused on weight and weight loss and they've already done you know diet a b c d E, F, you know, Z, whatever. So they don't know that there's more to it than that, um, that we really can focus on the whole person, not just sort of body size and scale numbers and things like that. So I think the more we can sort of promote that word, the, the more folks get to experience the benefits of naturopathic medicine. Yes, here is hoping. I I feel the same way, Caitlin. I'm so excited and glad that I found you. So my last thing I'll ask you to tell everyone, Caitlin, is where can people find you? Because I know people are going to want to find you after hearing this. Uh, I there's one place to find me, which is my website, uh, drcaitlin.com. That's you know, uh, I got I got the Dr. Caitlin. Most of the other Caitlins in the world are like a decade younger than me. They hadn't gone to medical school yet. So yes. Uh, Dr. K- yes, I got it. So drkaitlin.com is where you can find me. I have a newsletter folks can sign up for on my website, which is probably the best way to stay in touch with me. Um, I'm a social media minimalist. I do have an Instagram, which is Dr. Caitlin O. I post once a year. Last three years, it's just been pictures of uh, black eyed peas on New Year's Day because I have a... <laughs> I have a tradition that if I don't do that, I'm going to have an unlucky year. So it's a Black Eyed Pea fan account. So if you're interested in Black Eyed Pea content, that's, I don't know if that, do you guys do that on Australia? Do you eat Black Eyed Peas on the New Year? No, that is the first time I have heard of that. I've got uh, to say. It's a Southern, it's a Southern tradition in the United uh, States that I've sort of yeah. picked up. Amazing. Um, so on the first day of the New Year, you eat Black Eyed Peas for good luck. Wow. Okay, cool. I yeah, never heard of that. Might as well. You can't, you know, can't hurt. It can't. Um, can't. So yeah, my my website and then my the podcast will be um on all sort of the major podcast platforms, but will also be accessible via my website as well. So that's just drcaitlin.com. Easy peasy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. This has been a blast. Yeah, it was Great. so fun. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Caitlin, and thank you, folks, for being here. The theme song is Evening Glow by John Anderson. Until next time.